Father Connolly soon goes beyond preaching. He announces the formation of a peace society to help stamp out the epidemic of crime in the area. They signed an oath in the church to keep the peace. My take on it, just my theory and my logically thinking that it was probably formed with good intent. But Detective Boyd finds something ominous about the oath book of the Peace Society. Suspect John Kennedy is a prominent member, as is James Carroll, rumored to be the leader of a more militant inner group. For the first time, the anti-Donnelly faction appears to be working together as a group. Initially, the purpose was to prevent crime. And eventually, it very quickly became dedicated to let's do something about the Donnellys. For Boyd, it is time for a critical stage of his reinvestigation. He is ready to take a minute-by-minute -minute look at the night of the legendary crime. It's one thing to read about it. It's another thing to actually be there uh, to almost get your head into that scene as it's being described and as it was at that time. February 3rd, 1880. In rural Ontario, it is a cold, bright winter's night. A mob slowly gathers. Some had clubs, some had axes or hatchets. A couple of them had guns. Inside the main Donnelly farmhouse, James Sr. and his wife Johanna are winding down the day. Three others are present. Tom Donnelly, the youngest son, Bridget Donnelly, a relative from Ireland, and a 13-year-old boy named Johnny O'Connor, the son of a family friend. Detective Michael Boyd and Ray Fazekas return to the location of the Donnelly homestead to envision how the house must have stood in the winter of 1880. Next, they meet with Sheila Hodgins, who has reconfigured a similar homestead to match the Donnelly farmhouse on the night of the murders. They prepare to go over the murder minute by minute, using the controversial testimony of young Johnny O'Connor as a guide. A single candle burns. It is extinguished just before midnight. Outside, the mob quietly approaches the Donnelly farm. One man enters first. He lit a candle, took it into the small bedroom where Tom was sleeping. He handcuffed Tom. The move ensures that the strongest Donnelly won't be able to defend his family. With Tom handcuffed, the intruder wakes James Sr. Johnny O'Connor awakens to a bit of commotion, and he recognizes a man standing in the doorway. He held the candle for the old man to find his coat. The coat was under my head. When the old man got his coat, he went out. Johnny remains hidden while the Donnelly family filters into the kitchen, unaware that a large mob has circled their home. A yell signals the men outside that it is time to make their move. The door bursts open as angry men rush in swinging weapons. A frightened Johnny O'Connor hides beneath the bed. He listens as the murderous mob beats the Donalds. He slides behind a clothes basket, sure that he will meet a similar fate. Tom, he fought his way apparently out of the kitchen and through the front room, ran through here. Johnny hears Tom intercepted outside the house. He is beaten, then dragged back in. I heard them throw him down on the floor. Then the fellow hit him with three or four whacks with his face. I peeped out. 
I just looked out and immediately drew my head back. Part of the controversy surrounding Johnny's story centers around whether or not he could see anything clearly from his hiding spot beneath the bed. And what I'd like to do, just get some sort of sense um, as to what uh, Johnny O'Connor could see, because he mentioned talking about seeing the foot of the stairs and also being able to look out and see, actually see some of the, the suspects. Yes, and I can see the end of the staircase right now. And uh, what he said under oath, I, I think I could see the same thing right here. With dead and dying members of the Donnelly family sprawled across the floor, the mob prepares to cover their tracks. They began to spread coal oil over the house and the bodies, and then they set it on fire. I got out from under the bed. I went to the front room and saw Tom dead on the floor. Then I ran out to the kitchen. The old woman was lying between the door from the front room into the kitchen. Once outside, Johnny O'Connor dashes for help. Bazekas shows Boyd the escape route taken by Johnny O'Connor. It leads out of the Donnelly yard and over to a nearby farmhouse owned by the Whalen family. of course wrapped him in a blanket and said you know what's wrong what's wrong and Johnny stammered out that the Donnelly's were dead and their house was burning furthermore the boy claims to have recognized faces in the mob and the first thing the Whalen say to him is shut up you know we you're gonna drag us all into court if you say this Inside the replica of the crime scene, Detective Boyd makes a telling discovery. According to Johnny's story, bodies lay in specific locations when he fled from the house. Johnny O'Connor actually saw and was confronted with two bodies as he ran out. And he describes the two uh, and where they were located. These locations correspond exactly with where police found bodies the following day it makes sense. It adds credibility to uh, his account. In 1880, due to his young age, Johnny O'Connor's story will be greeted with skepticism. For Michael Boyd, a modern investigative technique called SCAN, or scientific content analysis, may put the speculation to rest once and for all. SCAN analyzes written testimony for signs of truth or deception. It is a kind of lie detector that can reach back into time. I personally have used it on approximately 300 cases, and I can't find any flaw in the technique at all. I'll be looking for evidence that the person speaking is making a firm psychological commitment to the words that they're describing. In some cases, people's words betray their actions. What I'm seeing is the use of pronouns, uh, William talking in first person past tense. I'm looking at the verb choice that, uh, that he's making and the words that he's using. Boyd notices many telltale clues in Johnny's testimony, but before he reaches any final conclusions, he first needs to follow the tragic events of February 4th, 1880, to their bitter end. After leaving one farm in flames, the mob approaches a separate Donnelly homestead. Inside, second son William is oblivious to what is now coming his way.